In 1986, Techno's Japan developed the street beat em up Niketsu Kuha Kunyokun, translating roughly to the incredible title of Hot Blooded Tough Guy Kunyo. It was supposedly based around the youth of developer Yoshisha Kishimoto, named Kunio in the game after Techno's founder, Kunio Taki. In the game, just like his youth, Kunio is keen to kick the gang related ass repeatedly after his friend, Hiroshi. Thankfully for you and me, it was released as Renegade in Western regions and instead follows what would become a familiar story of a guy who's keen to destroy successive rounds of gang members in order to rescue his captive girlfriend. But regardless of backstory, it was a crucial point in video game evolution. This is the game which created the arena side-scrolling beat-em-up genre. Without Renegade, we wouldn't have titles like Final Fight, Streets of Rage, Cadillacs and Dinosaurs, River City Ransom, or the Phenomenon of Double Dragon. Double Dragon was also developed by Technos, with the odd nod to its predecessor and forming the immediate technological successor to Renegade, and because of that had some notable differences. The hardware now consisted of multiple processing units, adding a 1 MHz Hitachi 63701 8-bit microcontroller to dual 3.5 MHz Hitachi 6309 CPUs. This allowed for richer, detailed environments with larger and more on-screen sprites. However, Double Dragon pushed the limits and would still suffer from slowdown during crowded segments. You could now arm yourself with weapons also allowing for taking down those hench abobos. Significantly though, a friend could now join the action, which not only created an incredibly fun experience, it also added to the game's storyline. <laughs> yes, that incredibly articulated storyline. After receiving a swift gut punch, a woman named Marion is kidnapped by the partially undressed Black Warriors gang, right outside the finest pub in the land, the English Tear. Brothers Spike and Hammer, who sound like a bad jazz duo in their westernized incarnations, swiftly exit from their Matin garage and the Interceptor-style car to begin the process of kicking the crap out of every single topless Westside punk en route to retrieve their hapless friend. And whichever incarnation you look at, the story is very similar. Some, like the ZX Spectrum version, may lack the initial story element, and even the street place names. Some forget to join the torsos of the characters to their limbs. Easy mistake to make. Some don't bother with wanted posters or even arcade accurate levels. But whatever version you're playing, you can be sure that none of them expand out English tier to be English tea rooms, like perhaps it ought to be. I grew up mostly playing the ZX Spectrum and Atari ST versions, alongside my brother David or friend Michael respectively. These versions, although far from the best, are equally far from the worst, and let you tackle level upon level of enemy brutes alongside your faithful brother, who should really be called Billy and Jimmy Lee rather than Spike and Hammer. Let's cut that out right now. But regardless of names, there's a twist to this little game, but it only happens in two-player mode. In single-player mode, you go from level to level, kicking various degrees of ass until you finally come face to face with Willy Mackey. He was there at the start too, if you remember. Kick the crap out of him and his machine gun and your girlfriend Marion will automatically fall from the wall, walk over and plant you square on the lips. Hooray. Her modesty will depend very much on which version of the game you're playing and the choices of the developers. But two-player games take a rather darker twist than a pair of pants. A twist so dark that I'm going to have to try and account for it right here in this video using a series of disconnected strewn out facts and anecdotal evidence. Any normal person 
would expect that once Billy and Jimmy had fought together tirelessly to take out all these enemies, Marion would just be overjoyed to see them both, Billy would shake Jimmy's hand and then Billy and Marion would go home, with Jimmy perhaps going home to his bedsit or wherever he lives. But no, once Willie is dead, you have no choice but to kill your brother. It's one on one. All your previous brotherly love is gone. All the side by side elbow punching teamwork you've been through erased. It's now Billy versus Jimmy until the bitter end. And rather than being abjectly horrified by this, whichever brother triumphs, leaving the other dead in a pool of his own blood, is embraced and kissed by Marion. Doesn't matter if it's Billy or Jimmy, she doesn't seem to care. May you live happily forever. What, after you toss your brother's mangled corpse off a cliff? What the shit? Honestly, what kind of psychopaths are living happily forever after this horror show? Was Jimmy hoping all along that Billy would be battered to death by the thugs before the final showdown? Or was he waiting to relish in the opportunity? Who can tell? Maybe these are just the cards the universe has dealt them and they have no choice but to batter the crap out of each other and go along with it. And if you thought the NES version escaped, being only a single player affair, you're wrong. The fight between Billy and Jimmy is baked into this version, with Jimmy acting as the final shadow boss. She's then found sleeping in Jimmy's chambers, so whether she's happy to see Billy or not here is anyone's guess. If you want a clean version, you're best sticking to the Game Boy incarnation, honestly. I know I've spoken about this before in other videos, and you were probably well aware of the situation, but it's such a cold and dark ending to a video game that I haven't been able to get it out of my head for over 30 years. So where do we start looking for the reasoning behind this horrendous finale? Well, a good place to begin, and also to establish that they don't in fact live happily forever, is the second outing, Double Dragon 2 The Revenge, mainly because Marion gets immediately blown away by Willy's machine gun at the start. The PC manual tells us, Billy and Jimmy didn't kill all the warriors. The solitary surviving member of the gang nursed herself back to health and spent several years studying ancient oriental arts of healing. So, Essentially, Linda brought the old gang back to life, and I presume Billy or Jimmy as well because, well, neither of them are dead, although they certainly look different in certain artwork, particularly the ZX Spectrum release. The final boss of this new outing echoes back to the first in that we're fighting ourselves, but they're doubles of ourselves. It almost feels like there's an underlying metaphor at work that we're fighting our own rage perhaps, our own hatred. A familiar story to the first game, but at least this time we're united. Once the enemies are dispatched of, you're presented with a photo of the brothers and Marion, with a tear falling from her eye. I hope that's not an English tear! <laughs> perhaps a memory of what was, or perhaps as a sign of sorrow at what the brothers have turned to in their hell-bent purpose of revenge. Whatever the meaning, the what was seems more complicated the more you delve into it. In 2013, Gravity Co. Limited developed a kind of reboot of the second game, with the absolutely atrocious Double Dragon 2 Wonder of Dragons, released on the Xbox 360 Marketplace. The gameplay itself is barely worth a mention, and the story is fairly aligned with the original, but significantly, about halfway through the game, a tree bears a heart carving with Jimmy Loves Marion, but with Jimmy clearly crossed out and Billy scrawled in its place. This is just one fragment of many which suggests either that Jimmy was in fact involved with Marianne before Billy, or perhaps the brothers are just mentally ill and there's a weird contest going on here. Maybe Marianne is actually their carer. 
In fact, Marion's role does chop and change a lot depending on where you look. In the Tiger board game of Double Dragon, which was equally as terrible, we actually have to rescue Marion from Jimmy's hideout. In some endings of some versions of Double Dragon 2, Marion is brought back to life, leaving her in the perfect position to become Princess Noiram and the main antagonist of the NES release for Double Dragon 3 The Sacred Stones. You know, the one featuring Bimmy and Jimmy. In the excellent River City Girls, she appears as a shopkeeper in the downtown district. In the film, Marianne is a member of the Metro Task Force who makes Billy and Jimmy special deputies, and isn't referred to even once as a romantic interest. But it's perhaps the limited edition Marvel comic, written mostly by Dwayne McDuffie and running from July to December 1991, covering six issues, which yields the most compelling situation. In this context, she's called Marianne Steele, although her surname changes from place to place, and she's Oligopolis' best undercover police officer, who has penetrated the crime lord Nightfall's organisation. The martial arts warriors known as Double Dragon fight a more direct fight, but Marianne passes secret information onto them through a network of children to help aid in their battle. The comic states... Over time, she became very close to both of them. If she hadn't been so involved in her undercover assignment, things might have become complicated. It's pretty similar to her role in the Double Dragon cartoon series, where she plays a member of the Metro Task Force who helps the dragons but isn't romantically involved. Still, throughout the comics, Billy and Jimmy both make various passes at her and get into these strange fights with each other, with her view usually being, are you guys nuts? I'm not some prize for you two to fight over. Which in a way reinforces my original view of this scene, or how I prefer to interpret this scene as some kind of masculine show of entitlement. Marianne is obviously grateful for being rescued here, but she's also absolutely terrified out of her mind. Clearly, having seen Jimmy or Billy absolutely pulverize his brother. She must be wondering what in the world of hell is going on. Clearly, she's not going to ruffle the winner's feathers by freaking him out and running off. Best just to give him a hug and kiss, get home quickly, and try in some way to honor Sensei's request to look after this psychotic pair. Marion, I ask a favor of you, though I have no right. The dragon is complete in itself, but William and James, my grandsons, need you. Be there for them. But then, it's also an incredibly unexpected part of the game. I remember playing this originally with my good friend, and we had no idea what was going on at this point. Our initial thoughts were that the game had crashed, and we just weren't progressing, so we did what most people would, to start fighting. It was only after one of us bit the bullet that we then realised that this was supposed to happen. This was part of the game. And so, in reality, the only way to make sense of this dark, twisted horror story of death is to look from the programmer's perspective. It's an incredibly clever and concise manner to funnel a two-player game through the same ending seen as a one-player game, saving the programmers not only from having to program multiple endings, but also saving precious ROM, with Double Dragon already consuming a megabyte's worth on the original hardware. And there's certainly evidence that the developers were trying to finish up in a hurry. There are three unused backing tracks in the game. with one specifically that sounds like a game ending tune. Whether this was intended for an alternate ending sequence is unknown, but it certainly leaves questions. I mean, it's actually a really good tune, I'm a bit upset it was missed out. But saving time and effort isn't the only reason for an ending like this. It's also a clever way of creating an ultimate victor, making kids pour money back into the machine for a rematch. After all, the two-player mode was already ensuring it was getting twice the money of a single-player cabinet. 
So, of course, people were going to go through the entire game again just to pit each other off at the end, helping to make Double Dragon one of the most successful arcade machines of its era, and hence why you'll find the slogan, you'll never have to stand in line to play Double Dragon again on the back of most home ports. This, after all, was the first cooperative game of this type. It was an utter sensation as it was, but incorporating a one-on-one -on -one fighter at the end between players is frankly, well, it's genius. In Retro Gamer Magazine issue 103, Kishimoto explained, Playing Double Dragon with a friend was like a fight between human players against a computer, but when you reach the last stage and defeat the last boss, tough guys have to think, Okay, we were stronger than this machine, but now we have to know who is the best human player between us. And to know the real winner of the game, we had to make them fight each other. So, this ending might appear dark on first inspection, but I think it's more of a reflection of the developer himself. Rather than fighting in the streets, Kishimoto had just decided to take fights to the arcade, and that meant finding out exactly who would win among the real players, not just who could win against a computer. It's a strange ending, but if you scratch below the surface and stop trying to make sense of its context, you find it for what it is. An ending of personality, and one which not only helped Double Dragon to achieve great success, it also helped to define a new era of fighting game. It's odd that the path of least resistance is often also the best path to take. Just like sponsor Surfshark is the best VPN path for your internet access, if perhaps you're looking to unlock the 15 largest Netflix libraries, or maybe circumvent location-based price discrimination on travel or hotel costs, or maybe just to ensure that your data is encrypted and safe on public Wi-Fi. Surfshark is one of the fastest and the most fully featured VPNs I've had the pleasure of using, and you can run it across unlimited devices from just one single subscription. Surfshark has proven IP and DNS leak protection, industry-leading encryption and a strict no-logs policy through their RAM-only server network. You can access over 3,200 servers in 65 countries, use one of their many static IPs, make use of multi-hop, putting two VPN servers between you and your connection. And you can ensure your connection is secure using the built-in kill switch, and even make use of GPS spoofing on Android phones. They also offer 24-7 live customer support and a 30-day money-back guarantee just in case. Get Surfshark VPN using the link below and use code NOSTALGIANERD for 83% off and an extra three months for free. Until next time, I've been NOSTALGIANERD. Toodaloo.